all of our uh, echo sessions. So, Georgia Cancer Center, and I'm part of the hub team of the Teledurm Project, hub meaning those located here um, at the Georgia Cancer Center. Dr. Patton and I will be serving as co-facilitators of today's session. So um, I hope everyone has their own screens on gallery view so you can see other participants. Uh, I want to welcome and introduce our teledermatology clinic uh, healthcare provider. So if, as I say your name, if you can, um, uh, have your camera on and just give us a wave, that would be great. Dr. Sam Whaling, don't know if he's here. Uh, Ms. Lori Hutchins, Maisha McFarlane, Sabrina Watkins, Stephanie Cothern, Carolyn Jones, Floyd Soriano, Phyllis Solomon, Billy Stout, John Ferrier. Um, not sure how many of you are here, but uh, Welcome to you all. And I want to um, welcome the members of our Teladerm team who are here. We have Brenda Santiano and Kenza Mamuni and medical student Mackenzie Maloney here at the Hub Conference Room. Um, out there in Zoom land is Dr. Davis. Dr. Our, uh, our dermatologist, Dr. Davis, Dr. Rabinovitz, and Dr. Uh, Buchanan. And we have uh, folks from AU's Family Medicine Department and uh, probably some uh, derm, dermatology residents and other medical students. So we're all used to the drill. Uh, I see that people are really being very compliant about um, putting their name and uh, affiliation into the chat. We're all used to all of this now and your email address, of course. So if we can have today's slides. Um, so here we are and I uh, will review the agenda with you briefly. Next slide. So we're doing our introduction. We will have our didactic presentation by Dr. Buchanan, and that will be on facial lesions uh, today. And then we'll have a presentation by our fourth year medical student, um, um, Amkar Mayor. Hopefully I've said your name correctly. And uh, then we'll have wrap up and um, announcements. So, um, let's see. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Dr. Doug Patton, who will take over today's session. Uh, Dr. Patton, as you know, is the Dean of the Southwest Georgia Regional Campus of the Medical College of Georgia. He spent most of his career as a rural physician, and he just said to us that originally he had no notion of going into academic medicine, but here he is. So, uh, Dr. Patton, take it away. Thank you, Rhea Beth. Uh, so, welcome, welcome back. Um, it's good for me to be back. I missed the last session, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of the group again today. Uh, we're going to run through these real quick, just in case there's someone who's new to the thing. But the whole notion about the uh, um, Project Echo is this notion of uh, moving knowledge instead of people. So let's back up one slide, if you would, please. Thank you. So this is this not this notion of using um, virtual meetings uh, to help you learn to use teledermoscopy and teledermatology uh, so that your patients can be better served at the local level uh, by uh, sharing the information, getting comfortable with the technology. Uh, so that we can address some of the disparities that each of you face in your clinic every day. Next slide, please. So um, we do record all sessions, as you know, and uh, you're consenting to being recorded uh, by participating in the session. 
Uh, as a reminder, this is not a consultative service, so we're not prepared for you to share any PHI during the discussions. Uh, there will be information in the chat about CME and continuing education for other disciplines as well towards the end of the presentation in the in the chat. You can always email questions to teledermatology at augusta.edu. Next slide, please. And just a reminder that we do collect registration data, participation, question answers, everything that is recorded um, for a number of reasons, the most important of which is to help us make continual improvements in the product that we're delivering to you, not only in terms of the tele-echo sessions, but also the support you need to use the dermatology equipment, the uh, molescopes and things that have been provided for you, and comfort with the referral process. Next question. Next slide, not question. <laughs> Again, there will be information in the last, uh, at the end of the presentations about continuing education. And you can e email Kenza uh, at kmamuni at augusta.edu or go back to the teledermatology at Augusta. You can also put questions or concerns in the chat. We'll be monitoring that throughout. Next slide. Okay. So it's my privilege again to introduce Dr. Kendall Buchanan, uh, who's going to focus today on uh, lesions uh, of the face and the peculiarities of uh, these locations around the face uh, and help us to understand how best to utilize uh, the teledermatology platform for that. So Dr. Buchanan, thank you so much for presenting again. Turn it over to you. Okay, guys. Um, can everybody see? Can you see my screen, Doug? I can. Yes, thank you. All right. So today we're going to talk about facial lesions. And I just want to open with an example case. So this was a patient I saw in clinic, 59-year-old male, and he, you know, came in for a full skin check and then I kind of got to this spot on his cheek and he was like, well, that's just an age spot. Um, he said it had been present for years. He did have a history of radiation exposure and chronic sun exposure and no history of skin cancer. So when I look with my dermatoscope, you know, whenever we approach any lesion, we think about this through pattern analysis. So I noted the colors, light brown and dark brown. It was symmetric in shape, you know, overall it was a round pigmented lesion um, and asymmetric in pattern. And we'll, we'll talk about those features shortly. And it was slightly disorganized. The key features that I noted were a circle within a circle, irregular gray brown pigmentation between the hair follicles, as well as this, what I call, or what we call early angulated line formation. You can see how these angulated lines form around these follicular openings. So we'll stop there and then we're gonna go through kind of how we approach facial lesions and then we'll go back to this case. So we kind of think about it in terms of, we first wanna make a diagnosis, then determine the type of biopsy, develop a treatment plan. And the main reason for doing all this is so that we can get to a diagnosis of a melanoma earlier and prevent unnecessary biopsies. So today we're mainly going to be talking about how are we going to make this diagnosis. And the teaching point for today is we're, we're going to be focusing on these flat pigmented lesions that are typically isolated to one quadrant um, in an adult. So whenever you see that, you really do need to think about melanoma in your diagnosis. Whenever we see these flat pigmented lesions, this is our differential. So we think about solar lentigos or solar lentigenes, seborrheic keratosis, lichen planus like keratosis, pigmented actinic keratosis, pigmented basal cell, and of course, melanoma. And as you can see, clinically and even dermoscopically, it can be very difficult to distinguish between these types of lesions. So we'll kind of talk about how we approach that. Now, the reason we have a separate lecture for facial lesions is because on sun damaged skin and on the face in general, we don't see that characteristic pigment network. And that's just due to mainly the facial anatomy. So 
when you think about the face, we have a lot of um, prominent pilosebaceous units and adnexal structures. And we also often will see this flattened dermal epidermal junction in the setting of chronic sun damage, as well as this thin epidermis, which you can see here. So if you recall, whenever we've talked about analysis of skin lesions before, and we spoke about that reticular network, a lot of that was due to the sort of undulating pattern of the epidermis and how that pigment is situated in the epidermis along those keratinocytes and melanocytes. And so the features that we see on the face are a little bit different. And so when we think about facial patterns, we can think about it in terms of an annular pattern and a reticular pattern. So the annular pattern is characterized by small circles that have a varying amount of pigment. And these types of lesions show an annular pattern. So we think about a Clark nevus, a solar lentigo, a seborrheic keratosis, lichen planus-like keratosis, actinic keratosis, and melanoma. This is an example of a Clark nevus, um, what we sometimes call dysplastic nevus. And you can see this pigment that is beautifully surrounding those hair follicles. Everything is evenly distributed and it's overall very organized. Another example, solar lentigo you can see how those white circles really pop out. So you don't see any irregular pigmentation around those circles that you can sometimes see in melanoma. And overall, the lesion is organized and very symmetric. Seborrheic keratosis, these can sometimes be challenging just because they can present you know, in an early stage and sometimes be confused with a melanocytic lesion. But as you can see here, you see these fissures and ridges that are forming in the center here and these prominent follicular openings. A lichen planus-like keratosis, we've talked about these before. Um, this is an example of the annular pattern where you can see those gray dots, granules that are surrounding the follicular openings. And an actinic keratosis, so mostly with actinic keratosis, you will see scale, a clinical or dermatoscopic scale, but you can also see gray dots, granules, and other features that can overlap with melanoma. And this is an example of a facial melanoma where you can see this overall disorganized pattern um, and this sort of gray-brown pigment that's surrounding that follicular opening. And when we think about a reticular pattern, this is characterized by fine, thin lines that can be short and interrupted. Mainly we're thinking about a solar lentigo and melanoma. So this is an example of a lentigo where you see these fine thin lines. And then this is an example of a melanoma where you can see these lines on the left are thin and thick. They're different colors, light brown, dark brown, gray. And you also see some angulated lines, which we'll talk about um, shortly. So when you think about pigmented lesions on the face, we, we just need to decide, is it benign, is it malignant? And so when we think about benign patterns, the main three would be a lentigo, a seborrheic keratosis, or a nevus. And then malignant, you're, you're going to think about melanoma, and then you have the patterns that simulate a melanoma. And these would be a pigmented actinic, a lichen planus-like keratosis, or a pigmented basal cell. So we've kind of already talked about some of these features, but Essentially, you're thinking of two different patterns, that annular pattern and the reticular pattern, and also don't get for the features that we've talked about before, those sharp, well-demarcated borders that can look moth-eaten. And so this is an example here where you see those white circles that are very prominent. This is an annular pattern, and you see those circles or rings that are surrounded by areas of light and dark brown. And again, the scalloped borders. Another example here, so this is going to be your reticular pattern where you can see different types of fine lines. So you see fine lines that are short and interrupted, you see fine lines that are slightly curved, and you see fine lines that are straight. So this is an example of a reticular pattern of a solar lentigo. Another example here of the reticular pattern where you can see these fine lines that are slightly curved, long, and parallel. Seborrheic keratosis, so we've talked about these in previous lectures. Now, there are different features that you can see with an early seborrheic keratosis as compared to a seborrheic keratosis in a later stage. The main features 
to point out in this case are the bulbous projections, which are essentially these round circles that project upward. And then you can see the early ridge formation. Now, sometimes when you're looking with your dermatoscope, it's challenging to differentiate between these bulbous projections and what you might think of as a melanocytic network. So those lesions sometimes need to be biopsied. Another example here of an early seborrheic keratosis where you can see where these fine lines have started to become thicker and you can see the early formation of those ridges as well as numerous milia-like cysts. So the main thing to know about seborrheic keratosis is luckily the same features that you can see on other parts of the body you can see on the face as well. So the dermoscopy features are the same that we've talked about in previous lectures. So milia-like cyst, comedo-like openings, the fissures or sulci, fingerprint-like structures, moth-eaten borders, sharp demarcation, the ridges, and hairpin vessels with the white halo. So I like I included this example because this was a great case that was sent in to me by um, one of you guys. And so you can see there's this isolated brown papule to the right cheek. And then whenever we use our dermatoscope, we see these numerous vessels that are surrounded by a white halo, sharp, well-demarcated borders, and these comedo-like openings um, or keratin-filled invaginations. And so this was a great example of a seborrheic keratosis. Another example, this was a patient I had um, come in clinic and she has a history of melanoma. So she was very concerned about this spot on her left cheek. Now, looking at it with dermoscopy, we see this orange color in the comedo-like openings. You also see these sharply demarcated borders, and then you can see the fissures and ridges. And so I had to ask her, I said, so what topical cream are you using? And what you guys will find that if you have patients who use self-tanner, um, as well as other um, sort of skin creams, um, that the, the self-tanner and these creams can collect in the seborrheic keratosis and can actually help you out in making a diagnosis. So this patient was actually using SkinCeuticals Floritin CF gel, which is at a low, low price of $169 per 30 cc. So just keep that in mind um, if your patients are interested in these types of products. So facial nevi, um, fairly uncommon to biopsy a, you know, a true nevus that's flat and isolated on the face. These are just some examples that I've recently had. Um, this actually came back as a compound or an irritated compound nevus. So you can see this fine erythema as well as these atypical brown dots and globules. It would be hard to make this diagnosis of a nevus without a biopsy. And then mostly what you guys will see when we talk about nevi are intradermal nevi. And so these can be flesh colored. They can have varying amounts of pigment. We've talked about these um, types of lesions before. And what you will find with these are you can see these brown globules and these fine linear or slightly curved and wavy vessels. And so these are intradermal nevi. They can sometimes be confused with a basal cell. And now we'll move on to the melanoma sim simulators and we will talk about each of these. So the first one, we've talked about pigmented basal cell carcinoma before. Um, the main features include blue ovoid nests, blue glo globules, serpentine branched or arborizing vessels, leaf-like areas, and ulceration. So this is an example here of this blue kind of black papule on the, the left temple. And what you see on dermoscopy are these multiple blue gray dots and globules. Another patient here, she had this brown spot on her left cheek. And you can see this diffuse sort of scattered brown pigment um, or blue gray dots and globules. And then you at the periphery, you can also see this small arborizing vessel. So these are both examples of a pigmented basal cell. Typically with your dermatoscope, these are fairly easy to diagnose because there's so many features that we've talked about in previous lectures 
that you just don't see with other types of neoplasms. And then another case that was um, a patient of Dr. Rabinovitz, and you can see here how clinically this would be very, very challenging to, to distinguish between a nodular melanoma. When you use your dermatoscope, you see that blue-white veil, you see these blue ovoid nests, which are these large blue oval structures, and then you can see this black area, which is an area of ulceration, and so this was a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Pigmented actinic keratosis. So the features that we see with a pigmented actinic are basically com combined features of a solar lentigo and an actinic keratosis. And so this collision is why we see some of these overlapping features. And so the features that we see are clinical and dermatoscopic scale. We can see an annular pattern, moth-eaten or scallop borders, gray dots granules, red pseudo network, white circles and evident follicles, rosettes, pigment between the white circles, and an inner gray halo. So scale is probably the one feature that I want you guys to take away from pigmented actinic keratosis. Usually, if you can't see it, you can often feel it. Dr. Davis always drilled that in our heads because you'll do your skin exam and then the patient will point out something to you and they'll describe it as a very rough or gritty texture. And so here you can see that clinical and dermatoscopic scale. This is an example of the annular pattern where you can see this gray pigmentation that's surrounding the adnexal openings. And again, the moth-eaten scallop borders. You can see these diffuse gray dots granules. We've talked about this pattern before of the strawberry pattern or what we call a red pseudo network. And then with pigmented actinic keratosis, you can also see these evident follicles with white circles. And so they tend to make this targetory appearance because you see these yellow keratotic plugs that are surrounded by a white halo. You can see rosettes, which are very common in actinic keratosis and can also be seen in squamous cell carcinoma, um, as well as other types of lesions. And rosettes, remember, are those four white circles that are put together in a flower-like arrangement. Pigment between the white circles, you can see in pigmented actinic keratoses, and then this sort of inner gray halo as well. Now we will talk about lichen planus-like keratosis. So if you recall, a lichen planus-like keratosis is a solar lentigo or seborrheic keratosis that's undergoing regression. So that's why we have overlap features of a lentigo or seborrheic keratosis. And then we also see these diffuse gray dots and granules. So when we specifically are talking about facial lichen planus planus like keratosis, we want to look to see if we only see diffuse gray dots and granules or gray dots and granules that are in an annular pattern without other melanoma specific features. And the reason that is so important is because we often refer to lichen planus like keratoses as the great mimicker because they have a lot of overlapping features with a melanoma. And so what you can see here, you can see this diffuse gray dots and granules without other melanoma specific features. This is another example here where we've talked about this before. You can see these more coarse pigment clumps and we call that coarse peppering. And this is what we can sometimes see with a lichen planus like keratosis in contrast to melanoma, which will typically see more fine peppering. Um, and then here we see another example of this diffuse gray dots and granules. You can see they're surrounding those yellow adnexal openings. And also a few milia-like cysts. And then this is the example I showed, showed earlier of this annular pattern where you, that's really the only thing that you see, diffuse gray dots granules in an annular pattern, no other melanoma specific features. And then another example here, this one would be very hard, I think, to um, diagnose with dermoscopy without a biopsy, but it does have, again, that diffuse pigment in an annular pattern that's surrounding the hair follicles. 
So this was also a lichen planus like keratosis. So kind of back to where we started, we've talked about the benign facial pigmented lesions and melanoma simulators. And so now we need to review the features of melanoma. And so we're gonna go through these. So the, one of the first features are these slate gray to blue gray dots and granules. You can see here in this upward part of this area, those are all these multiple gray dots and granules that are irregular, irregularly distributed. And you can see irregular pigment between the hair follicles, angulated lines or rhomboidal structures. These are very unique. And, and when you see it, it should raise your suspicion for melanoma. But you can see how you get this sort of angulated appearance of these brown dots um, and granules around these hair follicle openings. They tend to make these angulated lines that can ultimately look like some form of a rhomboidal structure. Gray or gray-brown follicular openings, you can see here this inner gray sort of halo that's around these um, adnexal structures. And you also see very atypical gray dots and granules distributed throughout this lesion. And then you can have dark areas that completely obliterate the follicular openings, as you can see here. You remember how we talked about with the solar lentigo and those white circles just pop out at you. You don't see that here because this um, irregular pigment is completely blocking those follicular openings. So this is a feature that we see with melanoma. And then circle within a circle. As you can see here, you have this circle, outer circle, and then this inner circle. And so that is a feature that we can see with melanoma on the face. White shiny structures, we've talked about these before. Usually they're more um, or whenever we see these, we think more about there being an invasive melanoma, um, but you can see these multiple shiny white lines that are oriented orthogonal and parallel, and then blue-white veil. So let's kind of go back to our case. So as you guys recall, um, we'll point out the features again. So we saw the circle within a circle. So you see that circle within a circle. And then this irregular um, perifollicular pigmentation, and then this early angulated line formation. Well, despite these features, I wasn't 100% confident. So I called up Dr. Rabinovitz, and we decided that we would use our confocal microscope to kind of help us in determining if this lesion was benign or malignant. And so We'll go through this differential first. So the first question we ask are, do we see any features that we see with a basal cell carcinoma? And the answer is no. We don't see blue ovoid nests. We don't see any vascular structures. Our second question is, do we see any scale? Because when we see scale, we think about a pigmented actinic keratosis. We did not see any scale. And so... That leaves us with lichen planus like keratosis or melanoma. And so I knew that we didn't see just a diffuse granular pattern. Um, and we didn't see any areas of focal gray dots granules where we also saw features of a lentigo or seborrheic keratosis. So that kind of just leaves melanoma. So when we did our confocal exam, what we saw was this atypical network, and I won't go into too much detail about confocal, but it essentially allows us to kind of look at these ultrastructural layers of the skin, sort of like um, our ultrasound of the skin. And so you can see these bright white structures. Those are the um, sort of dendritic structures that we can see with melanoma. And then you can also see this involvement of the hair follicle. So the leading diagnosis was melanoma on sun damaged skin. So I had my colleague, Dr. Potter do an excisional biopsy and we saw this atypical melanocytic hyperplasia 
Um, as you can see here where this arrow is pointing all through here where these atypical melanocytes, all this kind of blue color is what we call solar elastosis or chronic sun damage. And then this is a melan A stain. And so that just shows this junctional and nested melanocytic proliferation. So this was diagnosed as a melanoma in situ. And so this patient was seen again by Dr. Potter and had Mohs surgery and had a great outcome. And I'll do one more case, okay? And so this was a 50-year-old male. He had this isolated pink scaly brown pigmented lesion on his left temple. And so I just want to point out before we go too deep, the fine scale and this gritty texture is very important. And so when we look with our dermatoscope, we see gray dots granules, we see these evident follicles. So again, those bright white areas that are very clear. We see white circles with a yellow keratotic plug surrounded by a halo. And we see this pigment between the white circles. So this lesion does have features that we see with melanoma as we've talked about. And so again, do we see any features of a basal cell carcinoma? The answer is no. The next question we ask are, do we see only diffuse coarse gray dots granules or gray dots granules that follow an annular distribution or focal gray dots granules and also features of a lentigo or seborrheic keratosis? And we don't. And so this sort of leaves us with our differential of pigmented actinic keratosis or melanoma. And if you recall, we did note a fine scale to the surface. Now, sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to see with dermoscopy, but we do wanna note the scale and keep pigmented actinic keratosis on our differential. And so this was a pigmented actinic keratosis and We'll just go over the features one more time. Gray dots granules, evident follicles, white circles with yellow keratotic plug, pigment between the hair follicles. And one feature that I didn't point out initially that is another clue is the rosette. As you can see here, those four white circles, rosettes are pretty uncommon in melanoma, okay? And so when biopsied, you can see on low power, numerous adnexal structures, which are the hair follicles and the sebaceous glands. And you can see that kind of blue here, which is inflammation. And then on higher power, you can see these pigmented buds of keratinocytes that are in the basal layer. And so this was a pigmented actinic keratosis. So I hope that was helpful. Um, don't get discouraged because I still need a lot of help with facial lesions. So these are very challenging, but I think the more that we continue to learn, um, the more we will improve our diagnostic skills. And so thank you guys. Thank you, Kendall. Um, we're going to want to move on to Encore pretty quick here, but are there any quick questions for Dr. Buchanan? Anyone? Uh, I don't see any hands raised. Um, I did put a question in the chat. We can come back to that later. Um, we need to. We can just hold that in place. Um, I don't see any hands up. So with that, to keep things moving, we're going to move along. We have a special presentation today by one of our medical students who's actually away doing missionary work up in Boston. He's up at Harvard <laughs> doing some work up there. Um, investigating uh, and learning about the uh, dermatologic or the skin microbiome and he's doing doing a research year up there in preparation for his application for his dermatology residency so I'm Cor thank you for joining us today and I'm going to turn it over to you and let you share your screen thanks Dr. Patton um okay here we go Oops. All right. Uh, my name is Omkar Mayor. I am a fourth year medical student at the Medical College of Georgia. And I'm going to be presenting this case of a 67 year old Caucasian male 
who came to the derm clinic for a routine skin check and we found this isolated pigmented lesion on his right cheek. And here's a picture of the lesion. You can kind of see it's this asymmetric 1.2 centimeter patch that has this variable pigmentation across it. Some parts are darker, some parts are lighter. So as Dr. Buchanan mentioned, whenever you have an isolated pigmented lesion, these would be your main differentials. Uh, melanoma, SK, solar lenigo, um, an LPLK, pigmented AK, and pigmented basal cell carcinoma. And if we look closely on dermoscopy, that can kind of eliminate our differentials one by one. So the first thing that jumps out to me here is these kind of irregular gray-brown pigmented areas between the follicular structures. You can kind of see those over here. And then if you look a little bit more closely, you can see these gray follicular openings around the hair follicles. So when we talk about all of the classic features that you see with the facial melanoma, you have gray, blue, gray dots and granules, um, irregular gray brown pigmentation between follicles. We just saw that. Angulated lines and rhomboidal structures, gray follicular openings, which we also saw. Dark structuralist areas obscuring the follicular openings the circle within a circle pattern of around a follicular opening, um, white shiny structures under polarized light and a blue white veil. So we already see two of these features, but let's go over the rest of our differentials to see if we can eliminate those. So for basal cell carcinoma, the features that you would see most often would be a blue ovoid nest, blue gray globules, leaf-like areas, ulcerization, excuse me, ulceration, and arborizing or like branching vessels. And here's some pictures of those. You see a little bit of blood vessels here, but you wouldn't really say that those are a characteristic of a basal cell carcinoma. So you don't really see those features and we can eliminate that from our differential. Okay, for a seborrheic keratosis or a lenigo, some of the things you would see would be fissures, ridges, comedo-like openings, milia-like cysts, sharp or moth-eaten borders. Um, and we have examples of those here. And I don't really see any of those in our patient either. So we can eliminate both of those. For an LPLK, you'd be looking for diffuse gray dots and granules or gray dots and granules in an annular um, or circular pattern without other melanoma-specific features. Well, we don't really see those. And we also did see some melanoma specific features earlier, so we can eliminate that from our differential as well. So that leaves us just with pigmented AK and the melanoma. Um, and when you look at a pigmented AK, you often find scale, an annular pattern, moth-eaten borders, gray dots and granules, a red pseudo network, white circles and evident follicles, rosettes and pigment between white circles. And you don't really see that in our patient. So that leaves us with melanoma as our differential diagnosis. So just to be sure, we did a shave biopsy on the lesion. And on the first picture, you can kind of see these atypical melanocytes in this nested peripheral proliferation right up here. Um, and then on the bottom picture, you see this flattened epidermis with underlying actinic degeneration. Um, also known as solar elastosis, which is something that you very commonly find in older individuals who have sun damaged skin, like our patient. And then if we did a melanate immunohistochemical stain, which highlights the melanocytes, you can see a bunch of atypical melanocytes all around here, um, kind of above the basal layer. So it's confined to the epidermis and there, there's no invasion of the uh, lower layers, which is a good sign. <laughs> And that gives us our diagnosis, which is a melanoma in situ, uh, specifically the lentigo malignant type. So on September 19th, our patient was diagnosed um, lentigo malignant melanoma in situ. This is the most common subtype of melanoma on the face, and it accounts for 5% of all melanomas. The risk factors are being a woman, being fair skinned, um, having sun exposure, which is very common for all type of um, all type of skin cancers, and then being 
in the age range of 60s to 70s. I think the average age of diagnosis was 65. Um, and then it's inside too because the cancer cells are contained in the epidermis. So here are some examples of um, our diagnosis in other patients. As you can see, it has this really subtle presentation. It almost looks very similar to a um, solar elastosis or sunspot. Um, so while the prognosis is good, the diagnosis of lentigo benigna um, melanoma in situ is, is often delayed because it looks so similar to um, those lesions and the ABCD-like steps that you use for um, identifying melanomas that you probably learned in medical school, as Dr. Buchanan mentioned, those don't really apply as much to the facial skin because the skin on the face has a different texture and thickness than the rest of the body. So it really helps to know the dermoscopic features that we talked about earlier. So for our patient, what is the next best step in management? Most surgery and follow-up in three months, most surgery and follow-up annually, do a wide local excision and follow-up every three months, wide local excision and follow-up annually, or do radiation therapy and follow-up annually. Anyone have an idea? Go ahead and put something in the chat. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I see A, that is the correct answer. Good job. Good job, Mackenzie. Bose surgery is the best option because you have this lesion in a cosmetically sensitive location, which is the face, and you wanna follow up every three months because for something like melanoma, you wanna be tracking that pretty uh, aggressively. So surgical removal is indicated. Some options if you can't do surgery for whatever reason would be radiation therapy or imiquimod, which is an immune response modifier. Um, it's a topical cream. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the prognosis is pretty good. It has a 97.1 10-year survival rate. Um, but once it does progress to a vertically invasive form, that survival rate is, is much lower. Our patient had most surgery in October 2022, three weeks after he was diagnosed. Um, and then this is a picture of him one week after that when he was presenting for suture removal. And as of right now, he's getting total body skin checks with Dr. Buchanan every three months. And that's all we have. Thank you, Amkar. That was a great presentation, and um, thank you to Dr. Buchanan also. I'm just going to ask you a question, and, and again, some of this um, primary care providers uh, sometimes are uh, curious about whether or not they could or should biopsy a lesion. You mentioned doing a shave biopsy of a, of a lesion that was suspicious for melanoma. Uh, earlier, Dr. Buchanan presented one where they went straight to excisional biopsy. Um, for anyone in the crowd who cares to comment, is there some particular guidance that we should use when we're thinking about doing a shave biopsy, precautions, those sorts of things? I will say for our patient, we only saw two of those um, kind of melanoma-specific melanoma lesions. Um, one thing that was interesting is that when you see a bunch of those characteristic features, that kind of means that the melanoma has progressed and has gotten worse. So as the melanoma kind of grows, it gets more of those features. So I'm not exactly sure when we would biopsy versus when we would kind of um, just jump straight to treatment. But um, perhaps if it's more obvious, then you would you would go straight to treatment. Dr. Buchanan, anyone else feel someone need to share? So, yeah, I mean, sometimes it, it depends. Um, I think some of it is also provider dependent as well. You know, we generally don't like to perform um, shave biopsies for melanocytic lesions on the face. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily wrong, but, you know, if you're wrong, then sometimes the cosmetic outcome of a shave biopsy on the face 
is inferior to doing an incisional biopsy or perhaps an excisional biopsy if the lesion is small enough. So, you know, the, the previous case I presented, um, we did, I actually don't, I think I misspoke. We did an, a more of an incisional biopsy because it was, it was still hard to differentiate if it was a true melanoma, even after confocal. So we, we were, you know, hesitant to completely excise the whole lesion because as you saw, it was rather large. So some of it just kind of depends on the size of the lesion, the exact location on the face, um, provider preference. But I do think um, the, if, if you have the ability to do an incisional biopsy, you also guarantee that you're going to get the deeper layers of the skin so that you can make sure that, you know, you, the staging is done appropriately because unfortunately I have had patients who have had a punch biopsy done in, in an area that wasn't characteristic of the invasive part of the lesion. And it was misdiagnosed as a melanoma in situ. And it was actually a stage four um, melanoma. So mm -hmm. I think you, you kind of have to be, be careful and, um, you know, na navigate as best you can, but, you know, in a busy clinic, sometimes these details can be very challenging. Sure. Thank you. Well, we appreciate um, that. Yeah. So the uh, only, yeah. we've the got, other, oh, go ahead, Harold. So the only thing that I would add is, is that it's not um, good to do punch biopsies unless you can have almost the entire lesion. And the reason for that is, is that in order for a pathologist to make a diagnosis, he needs the architectural pattern. And in order to have an architectural pattern, you have to have an adequate piece of tissue to give to the pathologist. Uh, broad shave biopsies are acceptable except for the cosmetic results if you're wrong. Uh, more appropriate is either to do an incisional or excisional biopsies. And the other thing we always recommend is the immunostains. Without immunostains, melanoma in stage two is often difficult to make a diagnosis. So what we normally recommend is the additional immunostains, which your dermatopathologist will get anyway. So for approaching facial lesions, punch, punch biopsies prefer not to do. Either incision or excisional biopsies are the best. Shave biopsies, depending on the patient. I was going to comment that, you know, we call those kind of scoop shaves when we really want to get the whole thing. We want to make sure we have that Breslau level and that kind of terminology, a scoop on the face is just not going to be cosmetically uh, appropriate <laughs> for a lot of these folks. And, and I will say the fact that now we have a confocal microscope is kind of a wonderful thing for the young, especially the younger patient, the more cosmetically um, worried patient um, to uh, maybe help confirm that diagnosis before biopsying excisionally um, so that you don't have to do an unnecessary biopsy perhaps. But we do have that technology that I think we're using more and more for uh, patients who are nervous about getting that spot biopsy. Well, that's great. So one of the things I want to kind of return to and, and emphasize for all of our audience is the notion that the easy access to dermatological expertise using the Moleskope, the dermatoscope, forwarding the images on uh, to any of you who are participating in this uh, gives us the opportunity out here where we're not necessarily experts to make wiser choices up front, whether it's something we can take care of here in the clinic or whether we need to refer them in for one of these more nuanced approaches uh, and, and even what type of biopsy to do. So. So thank you for that. Um, I'm looking, I don't see anyone entering anything into the chat, but we certainly have a couple of minutes of where we can entertain a question, uh, either in the chat or a raised hand. I encourage y'all to participate, to jump in. I'm scanning, I don't see any hands. I will make a comment about um, Dr. Buchanan's um, comment about the pigmentation of seborrheic keratoses that you can get from self-tanner, and, and they can really be exciting with hair dye. So mm. sometimes you see some amazing seborrheic keratoses that look, you know, just frighteningly dark compared to the background skin, and, and uh, if women or men are dyeing their hair, sometimes that's what's going on. 
Yeah, I was going to say, what about Grecian formula? Uh, <laughs> same thing, same thing. <laughs> so I did have a question, and Kendall, maybe this one was for you. It was prompted uh, by something you said. It ra raised a concern for me. Are there things that we should consider on shaved skin versus non-shaved skin? You you mean like like shaving? Yeah, does shaving increase a risk or decrease a risk or anything like that? I don't know about that. I would just say in terms of, you know, hair on the face, it, it can be very challenging to use your dermatoscope because the hair is just constantly in the way. So, you know, I've, you know, you kind of have to take a step step back in clinic because, you know, you, you do need to kind of clip the hair short so that you can see those obvious features that we talked about. And so sometimes that, that can be very challenging either in the scalp or on in a beard distribution. But I think most of the time when I've taken the time to really do it properly and, you know, kind of trim the hair close, like I have recently diagnosed um, two melanoma in situ in a lady's scalp that I think otherwise you could just kind of gloss over, um, but just kind of understanding that you you can still see those those features even in hair bearing areas is important. That's great. So it also points out the opportunity for us when someone comes in with a beard, but they can feel something in their skin that to be successful with the use of the dermatoscope, we may actually have to trim some hair to get a good image of that. Is that fair? It's 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 hard to convince them, but <laughs> I would say it's fair. <laughs> well, in, in darker pigmented skin, obviously it may be feel before sight. So I think that's mm -hmm. important. All right, well, we do need to wrap up. I do wanna thank um, Kendall Buchanan and Amkor Mayur for joining us today and presenting the cases. Uh, to uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Rabinovitz for contributing their expertise as well. Um, and with that, um, and in the absence of any other comments or questions in the chat, I'm going to turn it back over to you, uh, Rhea. Thank you. Okay. That's 